the problem with current materialist-based science is that only that's true what we can objectify, what we can measure, what we can duplicate, what we can falsify. Now the problem with consciousness and with subjective experiences, what you think or what you feel, you cannot objectify, you cannot measure, you cannot duplicate, you cannot falsify. For a lot of science, materialist scientists, consciousness is just an illusion because they cannot prove it, they cannot see it, they cannot measure it. So my, according to me, but according to many others as well, we have to expand science towards the post-materialist science to include subjective experiences because that's the essence of who we are. Welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It's Luciano here speaking as your host as usual. Um, before we get into here our next conversation, uh, I'd like to remind you, the listener, to please subscribe, share with your family and friends, and rate us. Uh, when you get a chance on whatever podcast uh, platform you use, we're on um, all major and most minor, I think. So it's easy to find us, obviously. And if you feel inclined to donate to our cause, we are not for profit, of course. Uh, regular listeners know this, uh, as well as a charity. So we issue tax receipts for those who wish to donate to our cause and our mission. Uh, you can go to our website, um, behindgreatness.org and see where to go from there. And while you're there, you can also see um, a library of our discussions that we've been having over the last uh, two and a half years with people all over the world, uh, interesting people all over the world, uh, and folks who have um, different experiences that uh, they've been uh, willing to share and perspectives that they're they are willing to discuss, and it's no different today. No different today. Um, today we have a scientist, cardiologist, and uh, an all around just curious human being, um, and a curious grandfather. I want to talk about this too. Uh, a curious grandfather to his grandkids. Um, his name is Pim Van Lommel. He's a cardiologist now retired cardiologist, born in 1943, graduated in 1971 from the University of Utrecht, and been practicing, he's been practicing cardiology since 1976. Um, or sorry, finished his specialization in 1976, practicing from 77 uh, to 2003 uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, he published several articles on cardiology, but, uh, or I should say, and not but. And uh, he started his research on near-death experiences in survivors of cardiac arrest in uh, 1986, having first experienced this, um, having first experienced this as a, 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 as a doctor or would-be doctor uh, from a patient, from a patient story in 1969. So 1986, 15 years later, uh, started to write and study NDEs. So he's the author of over 20 articles, most of them in Dutch, uh, and a book. And uh, since, uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say this. In 1988, he was a co-founder of IATS, so which is the International Association of Near-Death Near -Death Studies. In 05, uh, 2005, he was granted the Dr. Bruce Grayson Research Award. Uh, and Dr. Bruce Grayson was also a guest on this podcast um, way back in 2021. Uh, check him out as well as episode uh, 69. Um, and Pim, and this is also something uh, that we want to discuss, uh, and we are going to be discussing. He he wrote a couple of books here. One was called Endless Consciousness in 2007, uh, which was nominated Book of the Year in 2008. In 2010, he wrote Consciousness Beyond Life, The Science of the Near-Death Experience. Uh, that book has been translated in many countries and has now over sold over 400,000 copies worldwide. Thanks for coming on the program, Pim. You're welcome. Pim, um, question to you. Uh, this is your quote. Uh, so I would like, it's actually, it's a request rather than a question. Uh, you've said you need to expand science to include the subjective experience. Explain. 
Well, the problem with current materialist-based science is that only that's true what we can objectify, what we can measure, what we can duplicate, what we can falsify. Now, the problem with consciousness and with subjective experiences, what you think or what you feel, you cannot objectify, you cannot measure, you cannot duplicate, you cannot falsify. So for a lot of science, the materialist scientists, consciousness is just an illusion because they cannot prove it. They cannot see it, they cannot measure it. So my, according to me, but according to many others as well, we have to expand science towards the post-materialist science to include subjective experiences because that's the essence of who we are. And, and in the materialist science is still the never proven assumption that consciousness is a product of brain function. And it could be different as well. Yeah, of course, and that's what you learn in med school. Um, and that's what you, you learned. Uh, so we mentioned uh, here at the beginning when I was going through a little bit of your bio, in 1969, you heard a patient who went through cardiac arrest and was revived uh, be disappointed in being revived. <laughs> so you were 26 years old uh, uh, and you were, you were just starting your career. Uh, you, yes. ignored, you ignored that ultimately for a while. Well, I, I didn't ignore it, but I didn't do anything with it because I was just in a rotating internship and I was working on one of the first coronary care units in the Netherlands. It was mm -hmm. all new because until 1967, all patients with cardiac arrest died because there were no modern uh, uh, proceedings for, for resuscitation for CPR. So the electric defibrillation and external chest compression were not yet available. So it, because that was, was available, we started worldwide coronary care units. And so when I was just starting working on this coronary care unit, there was a 44 year old man who had cardiac arrest and we resuscitated and we gave him several shocks. After about four minutes, he regained consciousness. And we as a resuscitation team were very, very happy. It was all new for us. I was the doctor in charge. But the patient was very, very disappointed. <laughs> and told me about going through a tunnel, seeing a light, beautiful landscape, beautiful music, etc. But I was just starting my career. I was a young family. I started to be involved in modern cardiology as well. So I didn't do anything with it until 1986, when I read the book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, where he describes a very deep, extensive death experience, mm -hmm. which happened to him in 1943 as a medical student. He died of double pneumonia, and there were not antibiotics available for this medical student. So he died, he was declared dead, and his body was covered with a sheet. And the nurse was so upset that this medical student died that he was able to persuade the doctor to give him an injection right into his heart with adrenaline, which was quite uncommon in those years. But after nine years, nine minutes of being dead, he regained consciousness. He had troubles to find his body back because his body was covered with a sheet, but he saw a hand out somewhere hanging there with a fraternity ring. So he said, that's where I have to be. And he had a very deep, extensive death experience with all the possible elements you can imagine. And later he controlled where he had been somewhere 1,000 miles away. And really it, ha it, it happened to be there as well as he had seen it in his near death experience. So I was very, well, interested now by this book. And that's why I started to interview patients who had survived a cardiac arrest in the party in 1986 to ask if they had memory from the period of unconscious. And then with that two years out of 50 patients who survived cardiac arrest, 12 patients shared the ND with me. And that was the moment where my scientific curiosity started to grow because I had always read that it is impossible to experience consciousness with memories, with cognition, with emotions, with memories. It's of perception. In the moment, the brain does not function at all. So that's how it started. So 12 out of 50 patients, that's quite a bit. And those, yes. and those are the 12, I mean, we can assume those are the 12 that decided to share. 
Yes, I, I just asked one question. Do you have memories for a period of unconscious or for a period of cardiac arrest? And the answer was no. Or the answer was why? And when they said why, it took another hour because then they started to share it with me and they trusted me. So I heard many impressive stories as well. But it was the first time I really asked for it as well. So there, there is something, right? So these are patients in the Netherlands. So, so obviously in the Western world, uh, in, in hospitals uh, that are dominated by Western medicine, philosophy of medicine. So they don't say no. They didn't say no or yes to you. It's no or why. Yes. That's very interesting. <laughs> so why would patients respond to you with the word why? Because usually they had tried to communicate about the NDE with others, like say doctors, nurses, family members, friends, partner. And usually the comment was, this is just a hallucination. Mm. This is not true. This has been a side effect of drugs. Uh, here you have some medication that will go over. So, and they never talk about it again. So the, the reaction of doctors and nurses, people in healthcare, family members were also negative. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to believe it as well. So they kept silent and have met people who have been silent for 50 years before they were able to share it with others. So that was a difficult point for them as well. You also said, uh, and I also read it somewhere as well in what you wrote, uh, that the NDE experience, so the near-death experience, when there are people that experience the NDE in the East, you use India as the example, uh, they're celebrated for that experience. In the West, they're ridiculed. Yeah, well, that's a kind of joke, but I mean, it's it's in in India. Uh, it's so normal to know that you can be communicate with with ancestors, etc. That 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 is not the end of your consciousness. But in the Western world, for the last three hundred years, we believe that consciousness is a product of brain function. So when you die, when the brain function stops, it should be impossible to have whatever consciousness you can imagine. So that's people. The doctors and other people react so reluctantly to believe it. But also for the people who have this experience, it's such an overwhelming experience, but does not fit in the current world. I've met many doctors who had an NDA and said, well, what happened to me now, I've always thought is impossible. So that's the problem. So I read, um, I read part of your essay that you, uh, that you won second place for in the Bigelow Institute. Um, and we had two people on the podcast, uh, Sharon Rowlett, a uh, wonderful conversation with her, and uh, Jeffrey Kripal, who were both judges um, uh, for the Institute. And it was, a, it was a worldwide invitation for people to write on um, their findings, their belief, their experience, uh, their thoughts on um, consciousness. So that's why the title of my... The uh, article is the continuity of consciousness. I, I never talk about afterlife, of life after life, because life is a biological system and there is no biological system left when your body is dead. So there's a continuity of consciousness. I, I, so I want to talk about that in a few minutes here, uh, because I, yes. I, I want to preface this as well by some data that uh, you expressed in this. Okay. Um, and, and you said, so you were citing a recent poll, random poll, done in the US and in Germany. And this poll stated that about 4% of the total population in the Western world has experienced the form of an NDE, 4%. So about 9 million people in the US, 9 million people in the US, not one, not two, not 15, not 10,000, which would be an astronomical number, I think, because to speak to 10,000 people would take a lifetime, 9 million and 20 million people in Europe uh, and about 2 million people in the UK would uh, have had this extraordinary conscious experience. And NDE seems to be a relatively frequent occurrence by this data. You said to me when we spoke last is that there is a willful ignorance. I, I would agree with you. And this is the reason why we also have these kinds of conversations as well uh, spotted on the podcast. Uh, and more recently, why is this the case? I'm going to ask you another naive question. Why is this the case in the medical community? Because it doesn't fit what we have learned in medical school. So we have learned, that, as I told you before, that consciousness is a product of brain function. So it should be impossible that people can have consciousness, let alone 
and has consciousness with an emotion, with cognition, with memories, with the poss possibility of perception out and up above the lifeless body at the moment that there was cardiac arrest, where we know that the brain function has ceased within 10 to 20 seconds. So it should be impossible. So that's why people don't believe it. It doesn't fit our current materialist dogma as well. And especially neuroscientists, physicians, and also psychologists and philosophers have a huge problem to accept this new insight that the brain does not produce consciousness, but has a perhaps more facilitating function or interface function or filter function, whatever you would like to call it, and not a producing function. And uh, so they like to ignore it. And you don't know the literature. Uh, what has been written about what we call the non-local consciousness, consciousness beyond time and beyond space, which people can experience when the brain does not function at all. So that's why I call it willful ignorance. They don't want to read about it. They are frightened that the worldview they have and they've always written about could be wrong. And I understand their fear as well. Okay, well, so why do you understand it? But what is it? What is there to understand in the fear? Because they lose their research money, they lose their position at universities, and I know some doctors who have been professors who have said to me personally, "You could be right," but officially they said this total nonsense until they retire, and then they <laughs> tell me officially it could be right. If I was wrong in, during my career, but you have to be retired before they dare to be open about it. So money and career, yes. That's it. End of story. Yeah, I think so. And I can understand the fear. That's sure. what I mean. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 and and I, I, don't, I don't judge either. I just want to no. understand. Um, Excellent. Because it, 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 well, so there, there, has, there may or may not have been a guest on this podcast who may or may not have been an MD, uh, may or may not be uh, male or female. Uh, share with us after the recording a an experience an out of body experience that they had but had reservations sharing that on the recording and i think for this kind of reason um and i don't judge this this person is a wonderful person um and full of light and love <laughs> um but that that has me ask the question how I'm going to use a heavy word here. Um, how oppressive is the system? And I, again, we're using this as an example of the medical system, but a medical profession on this kind of thinking that one has to feel this fear. So is there an, is there an, an oppressive environment for this sort of thing? No, I don't think it's oppressive. It's just, it's prejudice and ignorance. Okay. It's, it's willful ignorance. I, I don't think... They, they do it on purpose, but because they don't have time, they won't take time to read about it because they're not interested in, and as I told you before, there could be fear as well. And it is the same for family members, or friends and the partner. When you had an NDE, you lose friends, you lose family partner, you lose your partner. The divorce rate is more than 75% because they say that's not the same person I married before. So it has a huge impact on your social life as well. Not only with the medical community and the healthcare community. Isn't that interesting uh, that most people have to go through that kind of experience to really understand? And again, this is, I'm not being judgy here at all because I, I'm, I'm starting to understand this myself. Uh, to really understand that the, uh, the, our, material, our material world doesn't really matter in the end because there is no end. But we live our lives as if there is an end. So we hoard. And even the, the question is, is there matter as well? Does it exist? Is there a material world as well? <laughs> that is another question. <laughs> we, just, we just had a few people on the podcast uh, very recently. Uh, so Robert Doyle on the podcast, uh, Marie Rigoglioso on the podcast, They're all uh, folks who live and breathe in the esoteric and they're unafraid. Uh, absolutely unafraid to share what, the, what, they, uh, what they do, including uh, Helene... Uh, Wabe from IONS, um, wow. and now most recently, Courtney Brown, who has spent a lot of his life and energy in studying remote viewing. And so we had this discussion on matter, 
and how there really isn't any, so to repeat your words, there isn't really any matter, it's energy and frequency. Exactly. And once we start to realize- And consciousness. That, and consciousness. Well, uh, is, it, is it maybe the same thing? I think it's a combination. I think consciousness, information, and energy are the three fundamentals in the universe. And I think everything in our universe, also in our material universe, comes from consciousness, information, and energy. And it could be the three together as well. Then why do we exist in bodies? Ah, that's a choice we made, perhaps. <laughs> Elaborate. Yes, let's say when your consciousness is beyond time and beyond space, it has no beginning, it has no end, it has always been there. So it is before birth and after death, it's there in a non-local realm, where there's no time, no space, where the future and the past is available and present as well. And in this non-local realm, there is an the essence of who you are perhaps the self with capital who will send some aspects of this higher self towards a body on, on planet Earth to learn lessons they want to learn. And that could be a, pos a possibility as well. So you even have stories of children who have said to us that they may have chosen their father and mother where they would be born. They want to be born as well. It's incredible, but it's true. There are the stories with honest young children who were telling us. We had Antonia Mills on the podcast. I've mentioned her a few times, and she's a researcher hired by Ian Stevenson in British Columbia uh, to study just this. So we went through some yes. of the cases on the podcast with her episode. Fascinating. Oh. But that had me to ask questions. Uh, I have um, a neighbor who has uh, a child who's uh, very perceptive. Uh, very forward. And I asked him when she was younger, did she say things? And you know, of course, he gave me stories. And I gave a story um, about a recent, um, uh, a recent experience with a friend of mine in Italy, we, we met, I was on vacation, he was working, we were passing through the same city, he brought his wife and daughter, and his daughter is nine years old. I, I mentioned this on the podcast with Thomas Verney, uh, who's a psychiatrist. And uh, she, the daughter, it was very, uh, very forward, very confident, shook my hand like she was a peer, nine years old, spoke to me as we sat down to have a coffee and an orange juice, uh, spoke to me asking me questions as if we were peers. So I, I turned to the mother, I said, is she usually like this? She says, Oh, yeah. I said, Well, when she was younger, did she tell you about uh, things that she probably shouldn't have known? And then she told me the same thing that you mentioned, Pam, that she, at four years old, she, she said she remembers when she chose her parents and yes. that she went and she said, I'm going to say this again, because it gives me goosebumps that she remembers first having to go down the slide of forgetfulness before she could meet her parents. Exactly. <laughs> um, What's what's going to happen when you leave your body? Are you uh, are you going to uh, are you going to reincarnate? Are you going to choose to reincarnate? I don't know. Could be. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a possibility. I always say it's a possibility. Like I see if there that done a lot of studies about reincarnation and published a lot about it. He says uh, there's no proof that there is reincarnation, but it's beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, and that's a scientific approach. I think when you listen to people, the Hindus, the Tibetan Buddhists, the Upanishads, the uh, Anthroposophy, the indigenous people, wherever in the world, they know that there is a continuity of consciousness and they know that you can communicate with ancestors, that death is not the end of your body. But also, Plato has said 2,500 years ago, the body is a temporary carrier of the soul, which is eternal. And he always has written that in that other realm, there is no time. So it has been known always, everywhere, in all religions, in all times, in all cultures. But we got lost, we, we lost it, this, this yeah. wisdom, this insight, in the last 200 years in the Western world, not in the Eastern world. 
I'm starting to agree with you. We, we've lost it in, I interpret that as we have forgotten. We have yes. forgotten. So we're re reinventing it again because <laughs> it has always been known. And now, thanks to people with the death experience, we get a, the opportunity to think again about what is death, what is life, if death, death really the end. And a lot of people still believe or are afraid that death is the end of everything who we are. And I'm now convinced that death is just the end of our body, but there is continuity of consciousness. Death, like birth, is just a changing state of consciousness, but not the end of consciousness. You said in your book, so I picked up your book, I haven't I haven't finished it yet, but it's, I have it here, I promise <laughs> you. Is, it, right? yeah. uh, a lot yeah. of information. <laughs> right. Um, the scintillating. Uh, you start off in the book in the introduction uh, by... Uh, <laughs> by simply stating science makes sense science equals asking questions with an open mind yeah that's my definition of science so forget the dogmas forget what you have learned on university but ask questions with an open mind and then you can really can learn new ideas well i mean the the scientific greats quote unquote uh and in our history especially in the western world are those those people like the the galileans exactly. Like Avi Loeb, uh, who's on the podcast as well, astronomer, uh, world famous astronomer, said Galileo was curious and uh, started to see, literally see things differently through okay. his instrument. And other people refused to to look through it because they had such strong beliefs. They refused to, but he had just had an open mind. And that's what we call the flash of insight. The, the flash, flash of, of insight. insight just comes in, and then you have to put it into words in our scientific world, that the flash of insight, like Einstein had it the same, and the many famous scientists had it as well. They were mystics as well. Mm. But not what they wrote about in scientific journals. They were mystics as well. Oh, Pim, that's powerful. Uh, Newton was also a mystic as well. That's right, who was? Newton. Oh, really? The founder yes, of was a mystic as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a. It's, I was just thinking this yesterday. I was uh, I was on the subway. I'm rarely on the subway, but I was on the subway. I had your material with me. And I was reading through it. Your essay. I was reading through it, and uh, I took a pause because it's. I mean, it's intense material. So I had to take a pause, and I started to listen to a podcast. Uh, uh, um, and the person speaking, very eloquent, a very eloquent fellow, and he's a bishop. Uh, bishop Barron. He's out of Boston, I believe. And he's being interviewed, and he mentioned the word mysticism and mystic and Jesus. Uh, and I thought, what? It's interesting how we, it, I grew up Catholic, so I grew up Christian, and I know other Christians and other Catholics grew up with the word mystic and mysticism as something completely married to their Catholic faith or their Christian faith, it, it, it completely it, it coupled with the Jesus experience. And the word mysticism outside of that experience was frowned upon. So anything that was mystical was not real outside of the Jesus experience. So that, that word for me, that word for me, just like most other people I grew up with, uh, was, um, was a lesser word if it wasn't tied to it. It was, had become a dogma for you. Yeah, correct. He correct. A, a, a religious dogma. Only in my own religion there is mysticism, and the rest is total nonsense. <laughs> so that's a dogma, <laughs> which is in in essence nonsense. <laughs> Why? It, 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 thank you, thank you for um, for sharing that. It, it, so what I've been finding is that, as well in my reading, is that these scientists, these philosophers, were also mystics, and there was that was never frowned upon when they were practicing their science and their philosophies. Uh, in fact, celebrate it. And that's what we've forgotten. I, thank you for saying that too. That's what we have forgotten, I think, in the Western world, that those can coexist. So speaking of coexisting. So that's perhaps also the word religious. Religion is the Latin word, re religere. It is connect again. Religious is connect again. So when you're religious, you're connecting again. It's the Latin word, religious. <laughs> I, I can't believe I've never put that together. Thank you. No, it's a lot of it. Reconnect. Of course. 
Of course. Well, and but you were so again on the same theme. Let's stay on this on the same string with this. Your book, your book, is part of the secondary school curriculum in the Netherlands. Yes, yes that's true. This is just surprising. Yeah. So, for 50, 60 years old children have to 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 read my book and have to to discuss it with their teacher. Yeah, high school students discussing consciousness with their teacher in the Western world. I, uh, uh, so you have five grandchildren. Yes. Uh, and you have two kids. You have a son and a daughter. And okay. so we're going to put them on the spot. We can edit this out later if you want, but we, we're going to put them a little bit on the spot because you mentioned this to me. Uh, so your your son studied law and he's um, uh, an executive. Uh, he's in higher management for executive search uh, consulting. And your, and your daughter's a psychologist working with autistic children. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, like, you, like your mom was, your daughter's very open. And your son is a little embarrassed about your public NDE proclamations. That was when he was a student, and in in, in the student community, and he has his his his, his room in a, a student house. And there, again, his father was on television about the subject of the ethics, and they said, "Oh no, not again." <laughs> but now he's totally agrees with it as well. But he was young, and he was just wanted to get a little rid of it of this. Subject, you always heard at home. <laughs> it, uh, so, so I, I missed your comment there. What about now? He's is is he? Oh, he's open. He's open. He's interested now. We and can, we can discuss everything. And your grandkids? And the grandchildren have know my book and have given lectures on school, etc. About it. So uh, they're all given lectures at their school. No, they give lectures in their class. They ah. read the book and give a lecture about the death experience. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, the Van Lamo grandkids, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I said, because what? you should remember that I have been on Dutch television, I think, 30, 50 times, and, and, and radio programs, and a lot of journals. And so, in Holland, it's quite normal to talk about any for a lot of people because they know a lot about it because of publications and, and, and documentaries. Yeah, and you know what? We haven't even we haven't even talked about your ten year uh, scientific experiment or a scientific study uh, that kicked no. off all, all of this either. So we just stopped in nineteen eighty six, but very briefly, nineteen eighty eight to nineteen ninety eight, you studied this quite extensively and scientifically. Um, specifically through patients who had cardiac arrests. Were you changed after this? Yes, it took a, a, a time, some time, but it changed a lot. But first about the study, perhaps. So, so we started a, a, a prospective study, a little 44 consecutive survivors of cardiac arrest in 10 hospitals because what I had heard from the 12 patients who shared their knee with me, it should be impossible. And there had been, until that time, had been just retrospective studies with a high selection of patients where you get patients telling about any organ advertisement or a lecture. You just have a selection of patients because a lot of people then you cannot talk about it as well. And then you don't know exactly the medical circumstances 10, 10, 10 years, 30 years ago. So, People thought, and scientists thought, it was just a lack of oxygen in the brain, or neurotransmitters, or hallucination, or dreams, or a side effect of drugs, or just trying to be interesting. So there was had never been a real scientific study done, and that's why we did this prospective study in survival of cardiac arrest because we know that in cardiac arrest the brain function stops within ten to twenty seconds. So when you have a cardiac arrest, you lose consciousness within seconds. Mm -hmm. The blood flow to the brain, what we can measure, is zero within one second. There are no body reflexes, what is a function of the cortex of the brain. There are no brain stem reflexes, the gag reflex, you put a finger in someone's throat, the cardio reflex, and there are dilated pupils who don't react to light. And there's no breathing, apparently, because the breathing center is close to the brain stem. So the clinical findings is there are no brain function left at all. And there have been studies done in patients, but also in animals, with induced cardiac arrest with EEG, that is the registration of the electrical activity of the cortex of the brain. 
that will flatline within 10 to 20 seconds. And no patient with cardiac arrest will be successfully resuscitated within 20 seconds. It's always at least two, three minutes or more before they, they, uh, they, they are revived. And, and all patients, patients with cardiac arrest we call clinical death because they're, they are like death, but it is, it is reversible the first five to 10 minutes. You have to act very quickly, start CPR. Otherwise, when you wait too long, the brain cells will be irreversible damage and the patients will die. When you have an out of hospital arrest, more than 90% of those patients die because they start not in time with your CPR. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very quick. That's why the coronary care units were started years ago. So these patients have the first stage of dying. And now we were looking for if they could report a near-death experience. And what we found in those 344 patients that 80% reported a near-death experience and 82% did not have any memory at all. I mean, we compared those two groups with or without an ND. There was no difference at all in the duration of cardiac arrest, two minutes or eight minutes. The duration uh, of unconsciousness, five minutes or three weeks in coma, didn't matter at all. When you have a, a very short cardiac arrest in the cath lab, electrophysiological studies, it didn't matter at all. You give a medication, it didn't matter at all. Uh, fear of death, psychological explanation, it didn't matter at all. Hmm. Gender, it didn't matter at all. Education, it didn't matter at all. Uh, religion, if you're a Christian or, or atheist or Muslim, it didn't matter at all. So there was no scientific explanation why 80% of those people with cardiac arrest reported an NDE. And we could exclude with certainty that a physiological explanation, like a like, lack of oxygen in the brain, was not an explanation. All patients had been unconscious because of lack of oxygen in the brain, and only 80% had this experience. And the other thing is that NDE-like experiences can also happen in meditation. In, in, in uh, severe depression, existential crisis, isolation, uh, walking in nature. So it's kind of what we call the, the uh, spiritual transformative experiences as well. They are identical with an NDE, but they can happen with a functioning brain. But for science, it's important to have these studies in survival of cardiac arrest. And our study is still the largest one and the only study with statistical ana analysis. And that was important because we did also a second part in this study, which is a longitudinal study with taped interviews two and eight, and eight years after the cardiac arrest with all patients with NDE who still were survived. The matched control group of patients without an NDE who survived cardiac arrest, the matched control group means the same age, the same uh, time interval, and the same gender. And we found a statistical difference in transformation in people with an NDE compared with the non NDEs, the classical transformation where they have no fear of death anymore, they have no insight what's important in life, and an answer to their sensitivity only happens with patients with an NDE, which is the objective proof of the subjective experience. You cannot prove a subjective experience, but you can prove the transformation, and that's what we did as well. Do you believe that the people that did not report an NDE did not have it? Yes, I believe it because we know from Children who have a near death experience under the age of five usually don't remember the NDE, but they all have the transformation. So you have the transformation without remembering it. The other interesting thing we found in our study is under the, the mean age was 62, but under the age of 60, there were more people with an NDE. When you had an NDE as a, as a, as a young, at a younger age, you had more chance to have an NDE cardiac arrest. We know from women who have been sexually abused, usually leave the body at that moment, have more uh, chance to have an NDE as an adult. And there have been one study done in, in, in children, prospective study with, with a critical medical situation, and 70% of those children reported a near-death experience. Wow. And the retrospective studies, usually NDEs due to, to traffic accidents, et cetera, aged between 30 and 40 years old, about 30 to 40 percent reported an NDE. So the older you are, the less there will be reports of NDE. And my idea is 
I cannot prove it. Uh, that way you got older, the connection between consciousness and body is more strict. When you're young, and until the age of, of six, you're open. As a child, you're open, you just have access to the non-local consciousness. But when you're 65 or 70, you need more time to get out of your body. Oh, everybody will have a death experience, but they're brought back within five to 10 minutes. So they did not have the chance to have the death experience. But we know from after death communication that you can have access with the consciousness of deceased relatives, especially in the first days, weeks, or months after the death of this uh, uh, loved one. And, and it is happening about 125 million people in the Europe and 100 million people in, in the USA who have the after-death communication. And it's a kind of proof that you still can have sex to the conscious of deceased relatives. Sorry, sorry, those numbers, 100 million, 120 million, those are numbers from a study? Or is that your study? It's, it's, it's not a study, but it's where you do interviews. Okay. Then you know about the percentage of people will, who will mention this kind of experiences. And then you put it on the total population of Europe. Then you come to these, these numbers. Got it, got it, got it. That, those are very high numbers. Um, interesting. That is very interesting. In terms of the stories that you hear back or that you heard back during this study, you know, we, we talked to Bruce Grayson uh, quite a bit about this as well. Uh, but we didn't. I don't think we asked them this particular question that I'm going to ask you. Of the stories that you heard from the patients who had these experiences, were any of them negative near-death experiences? Uh, not in our study, but I've met people with a frightening near-death experience. They exist. So I've met several people in the Netherlands, and that is a huge problem. Even there's uh, such a problem to share the positive ND with others. It's even... A real problem to share your negative or frightening and even with others because you have a feeling of guilt that you have been there. Now, the frightening and ease, let's say people who have a positive near death experience, about 15% of those patients come in a dark space, a dark room, which is can be frightening. And then this is sorry, 15, so, one, five? Of like one, five percent, okay. yep, have a frightening aspect frightening element in the near death experience. And then they see small light and attracted to, they say, quality tunnel. But perhaps one or two percent, but we don't know the exact number, see in this dark space, or sometimes go even down more in a hellish kind of experience, like Dante has written in the Divine Comedy. Sure. And, and, and also, uh, George Ritchie has described this kind of realm as well in his near death experience. So it can happen. And, and, and there have been studies uh, done, and there have been articles and also a book written. Nancy Bush has written something about it, and also together with Bruce Grayson. But also the positive the death experience is a spiritual trauma. So you have years of depression, years of loneliness, years of homesickness before you can able to act, uh, share it with others and you can accept your own experience, that you know that you're not the only one, that you're not crazy that it has a name. And then you, the second thing is you can start to integrate it. And it will take 20, 30, 40 years before you integrate your experiences in your life and change the way you live and change according to the new insights you've had thanks to the near-death experience. I can see where it's... Um, I could understand how traumatizing it could be, uh, especially if it feels really deep and really profound it, it, but, it must shake it must shake you up if you didn't have exactly. any of these beliefs beforehand uh, what are what are dreams to you what do you mean if i dream yeah what are dreams what is dreaming what are, dreams are also can be an aspect of this non-local consciousness usually people forget about the dream but you can have everybody can also have sometimes prognostic dreams that means that you have a an idea of something that will happen in the future, usually a marriage or a funeral. And then years later, you are there and they have a kind of déjà vu. I've I had a mm. dream about it. And people who write the dreams down can find it better. But also you come in, somewhere in a beautiful house in France, you can have a déjà experience, like I've been there before. That's only because somewhere 
E or non-local concert or sub-concert, whatever you want to call it. You have been there if you have seen it. So future events are available in, in, in dreams as well. I mean, you can also have lucid dreaming that you are aware that you're dreaming. You can change the content of your dream as well. But it is rather rare. But there have been studies done as well. Can you permanently leave your body? Can you expire? Can can you die? Can your body die through through your activity of active dreaming? No, I don't you, believe so. I always ask people, where is your consciousness when you're asleep? Because your brain is still active, but you don't experience your waking consciousness. Hmm. But of course, there's consciousness. When they put your body, you, you, you wake again. So there's always consciousness, but you don't always experience it in your body. And you don't have to die to dream. It's just... Dreaming is an aspect of your non the, the REM phase. You can measure it also in your EEG. That's the moment you're dreaming, you're active. But maybe, maybe you can die if you, if you throw yourself into your dream lucidly. Like maybe that's where our, con maybe you're closer to your consciousness, to your real existence. I'm just throwing this out there. If you're dreaming. And if that's the case, maybe dreaming, maybe dreaming is closer to the NDE experience than what we might believe. And because if we believe that our body is just a shell, our body is just a temporary thing. Like we don't even know why we have bodies. Nobody knows why we have bodies. But may, if it's just a temporary shell, why can't we leave? Why can't we quote unquote die? Why can't we have the near death experience permanently if we are dreaming? But first of all, you will not die because when you die, it is the end of your body. Yes. So you cannot die during a dream because you will not come back. So you can have an experience of enhanced consciousness, which can be a dream as well. But you can also have, let's say, an out-of-body experience can happen spontaneously, especially in a phase between awake and sleep. About 10% of younger people have the spontaneous out-of-body experience in the bedroom and then at once before they fall asleep, they are out of the body. I see themselves lying in bed as well. So you can get out of your body. When there is sexual abuse, you will leave your body as well. So you don't have to die, but you can leave your body, but your body is still alive. Hmm. I want to explore this further. I really do. This stuff is fascinating. Which is also fascinating is deja vu. So you mentioned deja vu. What is deja vu? Deja vu that you remember something unconsciously that you have been there. So you recognize something which you could not be possibly recognized at all because you have never been there. So it is stored somewhere in your subconscious or in your non-local consciousness realm. The belief then, your belief is that deja vu is real, that we have in fact experienced whatever it is that we feel we've experienced before, we have in fact experienced it. Yes, that's a possibility. Well, right, because I, I mean that would that would that would be an indicator of existing beyond time and space. Well, uh, that's that's all about non-local consciousness. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's the definition of non-local consciousness. There's no time, no space. Everything from the past to future is available in this non-local reality. And that's all these kind of aspects of consciousness you can come across. Also, the after-death communication, also the end-of-life experiences in the terminal ill patients, also the terminal lucidity, the patients who are at the end stage of Alzheimer, don't recognize their family members for years, uh, don't remember the names, or sometimes are even in coma. And then at once, they become conscious again, sit in the bed, see the children, call them by name, thank them, and die. And if you know that the brain function of ancestors of Alzheimer, there's just nothing left from your brain. And still you have, can have conscious experience as well. So uh, you have all these kind of aspects, what we call the remote viewing, I call it non-local perception, is that you can have perception from outside time and outside space. You can have non-local perception, remote viewing from the past that have been done fighting in Egypt, uh, places where never been 
hmm. known that there was a palace or something. Yes. Stefan Schwartz has done these studies. But also another place, also the CIA, CIA used it, also Russian people used it to localize. Uh, yeah, we, we had Russell Targ. We had Russell Targ on the podcast. Russell Targ as well. Yeah, we t- so we- it, it's just a non local perception. But what I also called is the enhanced intuitive sensibility that all patients have after an ND is the non local information exchange, what I call it. That means you receive information not by your senses or not by your body. So you, have a nowhere about an incoming phone call. You think of somebody and the phone rings, and that's the person you were just thinking about. You call telepathy, whatever you could call it. And it's also based on non-local consciousness. I, I have been paying attention to this. I non-local information exchange. That is that right? Is that what it, yes. Right? Uh, this is this is something I've been personally paying attention to the last uh, several months, especially. And I realized the more active I am in understanding when this happens, the more I find it happens, <laughs> <laughs> which tells me that this has always been happening and I've been ignoring it. Exactly. You have to be aware of it. Like Rupert Sheldrake have done it, but people feel that they are st- being stared at. Well, of dogs know that their boss is coming at home. All those studies have been done. Uh, Rupert Schelling has done it, and, and, and also about an incoming phone call. Uh, so these kind of things are real. Uh, well, thank you for helping us explore this a bit more. Um, when you die, uh, do you do you have interest, and in, do you feel like you want to come back and communicate to your family members? No, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps when I'm there, but I don't know now. <laughs> hmm. Can you will your? Do you think you? Well, this is a follow-up question. Do you think you can will yourself to make those decisions when that happens right now? I don't understand the question. If right yeah, now, I know neither do I. <laughs> can you? Because <can> <laughs> it's the first time I've ever asked this. Do you think you can help yourself? There you go. That's better. Help yourself make the decision now when you're still in your body uh, for when you leave your body about visiting or speaking to, communicating with your family members, your loved ones. It's a matter of free will. It's a matter of free will. So if you won't do it, it will happen. And the problem is, it many times happens, but the problem is to come in contact with their family members here on earth usually happens during sleep. And they said they had to dream, but it is not a dream. But when you dr- you sleep, the threshold of consciousness is much less. So the people who have our disease are more able to have access to the person they want to contact because the threshold of consciousness is less in sleep. So sure. those people will say, I had to dream about my disease, father or partner or child. But it is not a dream because you will never forget it. It has changed your insight in about life and death as well. Yes. So yeah. uh, uh, it's not easy to contact people here on earth because they have such a, a helmet of around Figure, their head. They're not able to reach. Helmet. Yeah. <laughs> um, last question. What, uh, what is greatness to you? What is greatness? I never used the word greatest. I, I, I used the word grateful. I, I'm grateful for, for my life. I'm grateful what happened to me. I'm grateful for the, what's happening around me. Uh, I'm grateful for my family members. I'm grateful for the nature. I'm grateful for birds and plants. Uh, and I w- would like that most more people will change their consciousness to change the attitude towards each other and towards nature, because the essence of people who had in the death experience is it's, it's what's always also called an experience of oneness. They are connected with each other and with nature and with plants and animals. They know it's all the same. Uh, there's no border between you and other people. Everything you do to others will come back to you in positive and negative aspects as well. And the first thing they learn is also in, in the death experience is you have to love yourself and to have empathy and compassion towards yourself 
and accept your all the negative aspects we have. And then you have to have compassion and empathy towards others as well, because you're all the same. You're all one. And that's the message we have to learn. And we have to change your consciousness to change the world, to change the, the future where our children and grandchildren have to live and survive. And that's such an important aspect of our consciousness. Well, I'm grateful myself for uh, reaching out to you and having uh, having this chat. So grateful okay. for your time. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today? There's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired. <laughs>